In today's episode, find out how you can get the government to pay for your staff training, plus give you a cash bonus for doing so. Welcome to the Tradies Business Show, helping you get off the tools and into true business ownership so you can spend more time doing the things that matter most. Now, here are your hosts, Warwick Bidwell and Michaela Clark. G'day listeners and welcome back to another episode of the Tradies Business Show. Today we're talking about getting money from the government. Woohoo! And we're not talking just your annual tax return if you get one. No, no. So uh, today's guest uh, is going to actually give us some simple steps to get some free training potentially uh, from the government. And it's an area that Michaela and I both talk about is letting go of things and getting help in our businesses uh, and often... Uh, you know, apart from not being very good at asking for help, as as tradies, uh, we probably don't know about a lot of the ways we can get assistance. And one of those is getting staff training and uh, apprentices in our business. Yeah, and there's all these government incentives and program out there to help businesses do that, but they just don't know about it. And uh, I think that's what will be eye-opening today about not only can you get the training paid for, but they'll give you money for doing so as well. Absolutely. And the numbers are pretty staggering, actually. I mean, at one point, uh, Wade shared the sorts of figures that you can get paid. And I honestly had to quiz him about it at the end of the show because, like, is that for real, mate? I mean, I need to look into that stuff as well. So, uh, yeah, very uh, eye-opening episode today. And uh, stick with us to the end because... Uh, the report card is in. <laughs> We've got some reviews uh, that we're going to read at the back end of the show. So um, if you'd like to get a mention on the show, go and leave us a review on iTunes and we'll read those out at the end of every episode. Now I've got a question for you, Warwick. What's that? Would you like more cash in your business? <laughs> I would be crazy if I didn't say yes. <laughs> <laughs> So with our show sponsors, My Old Pay Direct, they're a mobile payment system. So if you're on the job site and out and about, don't worry about getting home and sending an invoice and then chasing money. You can just simply with a smartphone and a little reader uh, take credit card and card payments while you're there on the job site and get the cash the next day. So mm. really great easy mobile payment solution. It's fantastic payment. cash flow uh, problem solver that one is take the money on the spot. So uh, thanks to MYOB for that one. Yeah, and if you want to find out more, check out tradiesbusinessshow.com forward slash MYOB. All righty, let's get stuck in. So welcome to the show, Wade Grundon from Face to Face Training. Good to have you on the show, mate. Thanks, Warren. Thanks for having me. No problems at all. So, Wade, tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, and your business or businesses and how you came to uh, get into those. Yeah, thanks, Warwick. Um, probably the my longest standing business is a company called Boss Hire. It's a civil plant hire company, and and we dry hire plant out to the civil industry, so excavators, uh, tipper trucks, those type of things. Um, also had an opportunity around about six months ago to get involved in some training. So being part of the civil industry, um, we saw that there's also a lot of training that happens out there uh, with guys on the work site and that sort of thing. So I also had an opportunity then to expand and get into a second business and that's called face-to-face -face training. So that has given me some involvement into the training sector in mainly the civil, civil and and building industries. So that's where I'm currently sitting at the moment as the director of the plan hire business and the operations manager at the face-to-face -face training business. So you've got plenty of spare time then, Wade? Mate, I do. It's uh, some early morning drives from the Sunshine Coast to Brisbane every day and some late drives home. So <laughs> I'm, always, I'm always praying for no accidents on the Bruce Highway. Well, See? lucky you've got our podcast to listen to now on the way <laughs> yeah. there and back. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and you're just saying you've, you've listened to every single one, haven't you, Wade? I certainly have, and um, and I've given it multiple stars to guys, so well done. <laughs> Thanks, mate. Well, if you uh, leave a review, we'll read it out on the show, so <laughs> everyone now will know who it's from. So, mate, can you give us a bit more detail on the on the training business in particular, uh, you know, size, maybe number of people you, you work with or the types of businesses you work with? Yeah, sure. We've actually, um, I didn't fill you in quite properly. We've actually got two training companies here, two what are called RTOs, um, Registered Training Organisations. 
There's one called Face to Face, which delivers training in the civil sector, so in the building sector. So it'll deliver training um, as in apprenticeship style training, nationally recognised qualifications in uh, civil cert three in civil construction, plan operations, supervision, that type of thing. And then we've also got an, a second RTO called Environment Training Australia, uh, ETA, and it delivers training more in the, um, I guess, the landscape and green thumb sector, you'd say. So uh, parks and gardens, sports turf management, so green keeping, um, those type of things. So so there's a really good broad range there. And, and, and we cover everything in the building trade from carpentry to painting to tiling to plastering, all of those sort of qualifications as well. So um, so we deliver a, a really good scope of training in, in those couple of sectors. So what's the benefits for um, businesses to getting training for their guys? Yeah, it's a good, it's a good question, Michaela. Um, I guess the word training, I, I'm always a bit hesitant to use the word training because I think people perceive training as, um, you know, meet us at the classroom, sit down in the classroom, get your pens and paper out and start doing, start, you know, learning on a blackboard. I'm falling asleep already, mate. Yeah, just thinking about it is a bit tiring, isn't it? Um, no, so sort of the training um, that we deliver, it's really probably a better way to put it is formally recognising the skills of, of people. So um, in a really simple terms, when people leave high school, they've got two ways to go. One, they can either go to university or two, they go into what's called the VET sector, the vocational education and training sector. And the government's really keen to get everyone who's in this VET sector to a minimum level qualification of certificate three um you know a guy comes out and he goes out and becomes a laborer or jumps on the tools and starts helping a a chippy or a bricky do some work they don't necessarily get any qualifications they might be very skilled in what they do but they don't have a piece of paper that uh, recognizes that on a national level so so what the government does is they offer assistance to get that piece of paper so to answer your question probably some of the benefits are Firstly, just people to formally recognise the skills that they already have. So when they're putting their name down on a resume, um, they've got some you know, formal recognition. Uh, probably the second thing is, especially from a from a business owner's point why, point of view, why they'd want to get their employees to go through these apprenticeships. It um, gives them some gap skills, so it helps to fill in any gaps that someone that they may need. Um, but one of the really good parts about it, especially from um, the owner's point of view, is it's very good from a tendering point of view and a promotional point of view. So um, people putting that on their uh, their quotes that they all of the people who work for them are, are Cert 3 qualified. It might be carpentry, um, it might be tiling, it might be drywall rendering, it might be painting, whatever it is. They can actually promote that as part of their quoting process to help their conversion rate. Um, but if you want to leave all that fluffy stuff aside as well, one of the other real good benefits is there's some good juicy cash incentives from the government to actually um, to actually train and upskill their workers. How how juicy are we talking, Wade? Um, yeah, good question. It, it depends upon quite a few different things. But without going right into it, um, I'll just use the word for people that are eligible um, to keep it really simple. <laughs> That's the qualifier, is it? That's the qualifier. There's the little um, asterisk with the disclaimer, the disclaimer on the yep, bottom nice, of it. Nice. Um, but if, if they're eligible, which is which the eligibility is not a, it's quite simple. Um, but the essentially the government will a pay uh, for the training to happen. So the employer has zero out of dollar out of pocket expenses. So they they pay us to go and deliver the training basically. So and there's lots of different funding models that we can do that out of, but. The, the most important part is it doesn't cost the employer uh, essentially any money. The type of other incentives is for some qualifications, um, they're placed on what's called a priority list or a national skills needs list. And there's things like carpentry on there and, um, you know, civil construction plant operations and things like that where they're high priority and and we're looking to put more people through those qualifications. And so... If people, um, if owners take put their put their employees or apprentices through those, they get some additional 
um, juicy incentives, which can be up to uh, up to about sixteen thousand dollars per person per employee over a uh, paid over over you know twelve to twenty four months in in different increments. So essentially, so it can be quite juicy. It is juicy, mate. So essentially, as uh, you know, if I'm a, a sole operator or a small uh, trade based business, I could either get current team trained for free uh you know if i'm eligible there's a disclaimer there or thanks for the dis- i was going to say don't forget the disclaimer <laughs> um or i could actually go and employ somebody and get some subsidies for that potentially if, if i meet the criteria obviously but it would be a way for me to grow my team without having to shell out as much as i probably thought is that right yeah, absolutely. It's, it's exactly that. There's some there's some very good incentives for when employers take on new full time workers. So, you might you might employ someone um, on a full time basis, and they they don't have a qualification, but they've already been working in the industry, so they've got some skills. So, that's a perfect time. And if you employ someone within the first three months, that's a perfect time to enrol them into some government-funded training because that's when the incentives are are actually the best. So um, definitely, definitely, uh, if someone is eligible, then, yeah, there is a lot of different pockets of money available and and not everyone knows about it. I think if you can imagine um, Warwick and Michaela going out and saying to a business owner, guys, the government will, A, Pay for training to happen for your for your uh, employees. We'll give them a certificate, um, but on top of that, if they meet criteria, we'll actually pay you for giving us that privilege to go on to go and give them the certificate. Um, it seems too good to be true, and everyone's sort of waiting for what is the catch? Yeah. Is there one? Uh, there's no catch. There really is not a catch. You know, the only catch is. Um, that someone comes and does the training, and that's probably another discussion around how the training is actually delivered. Um, yeah, but, I yeah, guess, there's no catch. There's no catch. Yeah. yeah. Ed, I guess that also from an employer point of view, you know, it's a good way to reward your staff and to be seen as upskilling them and giving them back and all those employee incentives as well. So there's all those benefits as well. Absolutely, Michaela. and. We, you're not the first person or the first employer who's rung us and, and asked for training to be completed or formal skills recognition to be completed um, as a thank you for their, for their loyalty of their workers. You know, guys, you've been here doing a great job. Um, I'll put you through a certificate three um, in whatever the qualification is in parks and gardens and, uh, you know, that's going to look great on your resume. So doesn't only help the the employer from an incentive and a and a tendering sort of business promotional point of view it it most certainly helps the employee um, going forward in their career yeah mm. that's about building yeah. that great team uh, that's going to grow the business without the business owner necessarily having to do everything themselves yeah yeah I think that's pretty critical too Warwick. like um I don't know, probably in my time in business, I think one of the things that I've always strived for is to constantly improve the guys around me. Um, and if I'm not providing some sort of upskilling or some sort of incentive or some sort of education to them, um, I kind of feel like we're not really moving forward in the right direction. So so when I discovered this whole RTO thing, I actually I was pretty sceptical of it myself. I couldn't believe it. But when I got into it and realised what, you know, what great opportunities were there. Um, yeah, I think it's a perfect way now for, for people to get that and not have to, not to cost them, not to cost them a lot of money and a lot of time to deliver it. So, mm. well, not to cost them any money or a lot of time to deliver it. Yeah. And Wade, you must have seen some businesses that <clears throat> have done that, have put on, uh, people and taken advantage of some of these incentives and it's transformed their business. Have, have you seen any businesses where, you know, you've watched that roll out over time? Yeah, definitely. Um, one of the one of the big things with it is there might be, um, without getting into sort of too much of the detail, I suppose, um, there might be in a in a certain qualification there might be twenty units to complete, um, and someone might already be skilled enough to to do what's called recognition of prior learning. So ten of those units, um, they they just already get because they already know the other skills. So 
by training out the the second ten and giving them giving the guys the skills to be able to deliver that knowledge. Um, certainly, mate, we've seen many businesses that have improved from a from an efficiency point of view, um, and from a from a speed point of view. You know, less mistakes means less reworks, which means more dollars on the bottom line. So, so there certainly is um, a quantifiable dollar figure that can come out as a benefit from getting it done, for sure. And so a lot of clients that I work with around getting help and support in their business, they really do often find it hard to let go of work and that control in the business and start to get help. And we all know the benefits to that. But getting over that initial hurdle of deciding to get help and going down that path, do you have any tips for business owners to get to that point? Yeah, that's a great, really good one, Carla. Um, I think that from... Yeah, I'm not too sure how to answer that one. Um, should I just read out my phone number and they can ring me and talk to me? <laughs> we'll do it at the end of the show, won't <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I think, you know, I've been guilty of that myself too um, and really wanting to control everything. But I don't know, I'm a big believer in um, instead of having 100% of one person's input, you should have 1% of 100 people's input and, and you'll get more will happen. So um, we deliver the training. We really want to become, and I think everyone should aim to have this, is real partners in their business. So I think finding the right trainer, firstly, and the right training company that can come and uh, work with guys is really important because you come, a, you become a part of their business, quite frankly, in terms of um, helping them to upskill and helping the guys to achieve what they want because uh, what we certainly found is not every um, owner that we're working with when we're training their their team, not every owner wants the same, is, is not doing it for the same reasons. Some have very, very different motives. So um, so we certainly want to find out about those and make sure that we're, you know, delivering the training but also getting them the outcomes that they want. So, so Wade, you talked yeah. about, uh, you know, getting someone who you can work with as a partner, you know, as, as a trainer or a RTO. How how would our listeners, if they've made the decision, they've heard about the sixteen thousand and subject to eligibility criteria, uh, but if they meet those <laughs> criteria, um, what are some of the things to look for in actually choosing the right RTO or training company to actually work with? Yeah, sure. Um, certainly, the first thing would be what courses are on scope. So. Uh, everything that I'm talking about is available on government websites. So probably the the one is a website called training.gov.au. So firstly, everything I'm talking about is on there. Um, so finding an RTO or a, or a training provider that has the right courses on scope to deliver that. Um, I think the second biggest thing is the delivery method work. So... Um, for example, some people do do classroom-based training. Um, we do. We're very much about. I guess it's the industry we're in, but we're very much about face-to-face. So a lot of all of our training is delivered on site. We travel to the to the apprentice uh, or to the trainee and actually go and deliver it there. So I think your delivery method is probably the second thing: is what's the best delivery method for that for that company. Um, and then thirdly. I'd suggest social proof. So looking for uh, testimonials, um, current clients that the RTO works with. And and certainly I've been asked many times, can you give me an example of some clients that you're currently working with and, and give me their phone numbers so I can ring up and find out are they happy with how you guys do your training? So, so I certainly wouldn't be afraid to ask that question to any RTO, um, whether it's us or another RTO to get some feedback on how, how they deliver their training. And listeners, we'll uh, put some of those resources in the show notes from today's episode. So we'll, uh, Wade's going to provide us with those uh, key uh, questions to ask a training company if you're looking at that and um, some of the other links to government websites and those sorts of things that you need to go and check out to uh, make your decision about getting training for your team. So, Wade, uh, something else that <clears throat> we really need to talk about and uh, I, I made a note of this earlier, is uh, you like to roll the bowls, don't you, mate? I do like to roll the bowls, Warwick. <laughs> so much so that you actually <laughs> you actually owned a bowls shop. I did. So, um, 
Yeah, you've gone back a couple of steps there. So <laughs> prior to prior to the plant hire business, I was actually owned a, a civil construction company. Um, however, prior to that, yeah, I had a, a, a bowl shop. So we did. Um, you know, it was a retail shop selling lawn bowls and lawn bowls apparel, and also we also had a trophy making business attached to that as well. So, um, if ever we never won the championship that year, we just made ourselves a bowl <laughs> trophy anyway. So it was good. Always a winner. Always a winner. <laughs> but um, okay. one of the reasons I bring it up is, uh, you know, you have had small businesses, and now you sort of, you know, you're in some bigger businesses these days. But uh, our listeners, a lot of them are in that sort of small to medium enterprise space. Um, yep. What what sort of what's some of the biggest mistakes or challenges you've faced uh, in your own businesses over the years? That uh, you know the lessons that have come from that that you might want to share with our listeners. Yeah, good question, mate. Um, probably hard to say. Like you know, for example, in the bowl shop. You know, we were we were a very small business then. It was one of my first ever businesses. We turned over only a small amount of money, and and I guess what came with that, if I look back, was probably um, small-minded thinking. I guess is maybe might be the way for me to put it. But um, I think if any, if maybe if there's two lessons I've learnt on what to do to to improve, um, I think the first one is to be a goal setter, so whatever that case may be. It's, it might seem like a bit of an intangible, but um, I think the more effective I've got at goal setting, the more I've accomplished and, and doing that religiously, so that whether that's around sales, marketing, financials, um, team building, whatever that is around. Um, but I think the second thing is going outside of my comfort zone, so... I've never been a big one for really, um, you know, putting myself, jumping out of the aeroplane, so to speak, and doing the comfort zone um, expansion thing. But I think if there was one lesson I've learned, it's that to grow in a business and to succeed, if I'm not putting myself in that spot regularly, then, um, you know, I'm not growing. So they're probably my two things, goal setting and making sure I'm always putting myself outside of my comfort zone and then I know that I'm actually achieving something. Um, that's probably the two things for going forward. Cool. Jeez, mistakes. I don't know how long you got for this episode <laughs> when it's talking mistakes. Uh, you've made a couple, have you, Wade? Oh, mate. She wears um, many, many. But, you know, probably the if I had to choose one, Michaela, that you asked me, I, one would be um, just trying to do it all myself. Yeah. That's probably that, that's got to be my biggest mistake is me trying to you know no one can do it as good as me that mentality um, and letting go of that it's the, it, it's the biggest thing that that's ever held me back is you know me wanting to do it so it's nice taking to the time to put other people on and get them training them to do it and finding the right people on the bus uh, I think is yeah that's probably my biggest mistake in the early days so. Mm. And it's a great analogy that uh, that I use with with my clients, and uh, I suspect Michaela does as well. Is is we've got to get the right people on the bus, but we've also got to get them in the right seats. Um, and sometimes it's hard to to stop the bus, open the door, and ask somebody to leave uh, on the uh, you know on the footy trip home. But um, yeah, we, sometimes we've got to make those tough calls in business uh, to be able to move forward, don't we? Yeah, I'd agree on that completely. Um, and, and, you know, that's probably the comfort zone thing as well, going outside the comfort zone to, you know, if someone doesn't fit or they're, you know, if they don't have the same culture or the same um, philosophy as me or as you, I guess, then, yeah, I, I think you've got to sometimes make those hard decisions to get the right people yeah, to come a, with you. There's the old so. saying of, uh, you know, fire quickly and hire slowly. Yeah, yeah. Yep, definitely, definitely. And so what uh, – something we like to ask all our guests is uh, if you can remember a, a time where you've had a, a good or bad trading experience, one that's stuck in your mind for either reason. Have you got something like that you can share with us? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, we we lived in Toowoomba in a 100-year-old in a house in Toowoomba and we had a um, – 
just a little upgrade of a bathroom. We actually got a little ensuite put in this really old bathroom. And probably my story is of a good tradie experience. And it's funny. There was only, there's only two things I remember about it that made it a good experience. It wasn't the cost. It wasn't anything like that. But I'll never forget it. Um, and it was the chippy that was working who was organising. One, um, he took his shoes off at the door. And I'll never forget he wore white socks, which was just, I thought it was really unusual, but I remembered it. And because Christy, Christy, my wife, we still talk about it. Um, and the second thing was he walked in um, with a vacuum clean. It was the first thing he brought into the house with him. And I'll just never forget those two things because my first perception of it was this guy's going to do a, a very, very neat job. So he walked, took his shoes off and brought a vacuum cleaner in first before he started. And it was like, yeah, it was a week's worth of work, but they were the first two things he did. So, um, and, you know. True to what I thought, he did a, a very, very good and neat job. So, so yeah, that was probably just an experience that I remember. Um, I've never had it since. So, <laughs> it's interesting that those two things um, wouldn't have cost him anything. No, really. no, you not know, at all. And look at the you know memory that it's caused and, and made him remarkable in your eyes in that way. Yeah, yeah. It's certainly, I couldn't tell you how much it cost or anything like that, or what the bathroom finish looked like. But you know, I'd rehire him again because I. I knew that he, uh, you know, had that philosophy. So because he had white socks. Well, he had white socks, but he had a vacuum cleaner too. <laughs> were they clean white socks, Wade? They were clean white socks. They were. So, so there, there you go. go. Yeah, your next marketing plan is just to buy a hundred white socks. <laughs> Everyone <laughs> will be racing down to their local supermarket to go and buy out all the Bonds white socks or something. Yeah. Yeah. And, so, and the flip side, uh, you know, any any memorable disasters that, that you've got that perhaps our listeners can learn from as well? Mate, no big ones that I can remember. You know, it's probably the stereotypical um, thing that, you know, we probably hear every now and again. But, yeah, look, there, there wouldn't be one that I can specifically pick out, mate. I'd be, I'd be guessing. So, yeah. And so... What's next for uh, well for your businesses, I guess we should say. But uh, you know what what plans are in the wings for you, mate? Yeah, thanks, mate. Going forward, um, continue to grow the the training companies. Um, make as many small businesses aware of of this funding that's available through the government, and train as many. Um, you know, new people as possible to get them their Cert 3 level qualification is a very, very minimum. So we're going at a great rate of knots and as fast as we can to inform everyone we can in Queensland about the availability. I don't care if they use us or someone else uh, to access it, but just to make sure that everyone does access it because I spent a lot of years in business when this funding was available not knowing about it. So um, I think it's our duty to promote and then Mate, from a plan hire business, um, hope that the government spends a whole bucket of money on uh, on construction in the next ten years. So <laughs> I we think get lots a few and lots of plan hire. <laughs> yeah, and so that's that's where we're off to. Well, thanks uh, thanks for coming on the show, Wade. If people want to find out more about uh, yourself and your business, uh, where should they go? Uh, website is face to face with the to dot edu dot au. Or just call one three hundred face to face. Nice work. Well, thanks again for coming on the show, Wade. Uh, great to know that there's some government incentives out there that uh, our listeners can access, and I'm sure they'd all like to get a bit of uh, money back from the government. They've all paid plenty out over the years, <laughs> so it's nice to know we could maybe go and get a little bit back, subject to eligibility criteria, of course. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. Thanks, Warwick. Thanks, Michaela, for for having me on. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, Wade. Awesome. So hopefully you got a lot out of that and maybe, you know, 16 grand plus as well. So who knows? And remember, there's some eligibility criteria we have. We said that enough times. A strict disclaimer. (laughs) So if you'd like to find out more, head to tradiesbusinessshow.com forward slash 14, episode 14, and all the details will be there. And to make sure you never miss an episode, uh, hit us on iTunes, go look for the Tradies Business Show, and click subscribe, and that way you'll always get the latest episodes to your smart device. That's it. So till next time. Bye for now. Hold it, hold it. We said we were going to read some reviews at the end of this episode, and that is what I'm going to do. So uh, 
We've got a review here from Ben Cabinetmaker. Good on you, Ben. I'm guessing you're a cabinet maker. Awesome content, guys. Couldn't have come at a better time for me and my business. I look forward to your episodes every week, even more than Timbo Reed. There you go, Timbo, if you're listening, mate. Ben Cabinetmaker loves us even more than you. <laughs> I hope you still come on the show, buddy. Um, so thanks, Ben. And uh, one here from Angelina. Um, great to hear from a couple of hosts who get it. Love the real stories and the interesting guests. Keep it coming. Well, we certainly intend to. So uh, until next time, tune in to episode 15. Now you can roll the music. You've been listening to the Tradies Business Show with Warwick Bidwell and Michaela Clark. Want to get off the tools into true business ownership? Find out how at tradiesbusinessshow.com.